Very excited to be joined by Dr. Daryl Floyd from Blue Ridge ISD, located in Blue Ridge, Texas. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Floyd and other superintendents talk to us about why leadership is a contact sport. We want to provide this series as an ongoing opportunity to have dialogue and conversation with leaders that are out there making a difference in education and in their communities. And I'm so grateful that Dr. Floyd joins us today. So let's get started. All right, Dr. Floyd, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I am super excited to have this conversation. As I mentioned to you previously, we do this series called Leadership is a Contact Sport, but leadership can be looked at from so many different angles. And so I'm super anxious to get your take on a few of the questions I have for you today. But before we get started, maybe give us a little bit of uh, uh, maybe a little bit of your career trajectory. And of course, tell us about your current district. All right, very good. Well, this is actually my 39th year in uh, education, and of that 39 years, this is my 28th year as superintendent of schools. So I've done a little bit of everything in education, uh, both in Texas and in Oklahoma. Teacher, coach, uh, middle school assistant principal, junior high principal, did two high school principalships, and this is my one, two, three, fourth uh, superintendency. And so I uh, did 28 years in Texas, uh, retired in 2014 uh, after 14 years in uh, Stephenville, Texas as superintendent, then rehired immediately in Enid, Oklahoma as a large school superintendent, uh, 90 miles northwest of Oklahoma City, stayed there nine years and uh, came back to the Dallas-Fort Worth area to uh, be close to my 19-month-old grandson, and that's a lot of fun. Yep. And about the time I was moving, this uh, Blue Ridge ISD job came open, and uh, uh, they uh, contacted me, and here I am now in my second year as superintendent of Blue Ridge ISD in the northeast corner of Collin County in the northeast quadrant of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth uh, area, and uh, it's a great uh, school district. It's a growing school district. Uh, that growth has already come to uh, some districts adjacent to us. Is coming to us next. Uh, well, they, they certainly have picked the right guy. I'm glad you came out of retirement for the second time uh, to take that role. And I'm sure they're, they're really, really happy to have you. What's the difference between working in a large district and a smaller district for you? That was a big change going from a 6A district in Oklahoma to a 3A district here in Texas. Uh, I would say the biggest uh, change is that uh, not nearly enough peeps to do the WORK. <laughs> and Lord knows the superintendent is not used to doing the WORK. Uh, but a little bit of adjustment there, but uh, got a lot of great people here in Blue Ridge and uh, everybody working hard uh, to uh, do the best thing we can for students. I love that. I love that. Well, give us a little bit of an overview of your leadership style as a superintendent. And, and if you don't mind, maybe has that evolved or changed, you know, from a big district to a smaller district or, you know, give us a, a little taste of what that's been like? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, I left out the fact that I uh, teach adjunct uh, graduate courses for four different universities as well in their principal certification, uh, superintendent certification and doctoral programs. And the, the reason I do that is it's my opportunity to give back to the profession I've been in for so long and uh, kind of be a mentor to some extent for those coming up uh, behind me. And uh, one of the pieces of advice that I give them is don't be afraid to change uh, your leadership style yeah. uh, because I can look back now on my career. And when I was a young high school principal, for instance, I was uh, running around with my hair on fire, 100 miles an hour, and uh, uh, going at a extremely rapid pace. And I had a uh, social studies chair person, uh, the lead social studies teacher, who could have been my mother and uh, could have been my grandmother, uh, <laughs> came into my office one day and uh, shut the door, and she says, "You know, when you're good, you're really good, but when you're not, you're not." <laughs> let me give you some advice. How about you not run around with your hair on fire uh, at a hundred miles an hour because it's making everybody frantic. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, all, that always stuck with me and I appreciated her uh, willingness to come in and shut the door and tell me what I needed to hear. And uh, so I share that with uh, some up and comers, but also uh, I share with them that 
it's okay to say, I don't know when you don't know. Some yeah. administrators think that when they get the job, they're just supposed to miraculously through osmosis know all the answers, but none of us do. Right. And it's okay to say, I don't know. But when you say that, you need to follow that up with, but I'll find out and then I'll get back with you. And some administrators get busy and they forget to get back with Miss Jones when she had a question for him or her. And each time you forget to get back with them with the answer, it kind of chips away at your credibility. Yeah. And uh, so always uh, emphasize to uh, the folks that I'm mentoring that you need to be highly organized and very structured and, and, and remind yourself that, oh yeah, I need to research that and get back to Miss Jones with the answer. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great advice. I, I always work, I work with a lot of different leaders, both in schools and, uh, and elsewhere. And it is funny that, you know, when you get to that level, you know, there's this natural assumption that you are supposed to know everything. I think that's the misnomer we all have coming into a leadership role. And I, I like to tell people because I, I run a couple of different ventures, you know, I'm the CEO, but I'm really the CDG. I'm the chief dumb guy. You know, I surround myself with really good people and if I don't know the answer, I'm going to go find out. And like you said, holding yourself accountable to do just that really helps build that credibility with the people that you are chosen to lead. I think that is a key piece of it. And I think there's another part of it, too, that I tell people all the time that delegation is the greatest thing ever invented. You know, I've made a whole career out of it and <laughs> got it down pretty well. But there's a piece of delegation that sometimes people, leaders forget. Yeah. And that is that just because you delegate something to someone does not abdicate your responsibility of oversight and follow up to make sure that it is getting done correctly. Yeah. Uh, I've got a new uh, head football coach and athletic director that I hired and uh, just had that conversation with him this week about, look, you are, I love what you're doing on the football field. We're two and O and everybody's all yeah. pumped up about it, you know, and uh, that's great, but you're not just the head football coach. You're the head football coach slash AD. And if I could give you a piece of advice, it is as the AD pay attention to the details. Yep. Yeah. It's nobody's responsibility other than yours. Now, how you get it done is up to you, but it's your responsibility to make sure it gets done. Just like a campus administrator's responsibility is all things academic and all things students and all things employees. Obviously, they can't do everything themselves. They have to delegate a lot of that, but sure. they also have to take responsibility when things are not done correctly. Yep, absolutely. Oh, that's great advice. Going back to your first opportunity as a superintendent, what do you wish you had known going in? My first uh, superintendent opportunity was out in the Piney Woods of East Texas in Lyndon Kildare, and yeah. uh, I was fully unprepared for that job. Uh, I was very fortunate that there was an old um, superintendent that had been there for a long time that had retired, and he kind of took me under his wing and uh, taught me a lot of the things behind the scenes that I needed to know. And um, I, I tell people all the time, that it really doesn't matter what administrative position you're going into. Most likely you're unprepared for that. And you yep. learn on the job, just like we all have done. And I was fortunate that I had that kind of a mentor that had many years of experience under his belt. Now he was very old school and he didn't necessarily do things the way I did them, but uh, on things like school finance and things like that, he, he knew that stuff inside out and I was not very well prepared and he helped me through that. Uh, well, so when you, it sounds like a, a phenomenal mentor that helped guide and direct you. Have you found yourself in that same type of role for other superintendents that are coming along? Obviously you, you're teaching, um, but do you, do you uh, find yourself in that mentorship role for other superintendents today? Yeah, it's what happens when you get old. You get to be the old fart, you know, <laughs> and they tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, could you come and talk to these first time uh, superintendents and uh, tell them how it really is? And uh, I do try to focus on that. You know, research is great and theory is great. And uh, I have to do some of that in my graduate courses that I teach, but I also rely more heavily on now. Let me tell you what you really need to know yeah. and the real world. And this is 
this is how it works and give them some advice about a how to maintain their sanity in this crazy world of educational leadership that we're in these days and how to sometimes tune out all the mess and uh, focus on what's important and that's uh, making sure that students are successful and in um, my school district i, I shared with you the uh, poster that i uh, we have up throughout our school district and a lot of what is on that poster of the three r's and the four c's deals with just that uh, we are going to focus on rigor relevance and relationships now yeah. as i told you earlier um I didn't invent any of that. I, I did what we do in education, steal good ideas from other people. And uh, Dr. Bill Daggett is really the one behind the three R's. And um, I've known him for many years and certainly have subscribed to a lot of his uh, work and theories. But um, I, I embrace that because I do think it's important. Uh, yeah. It's our job to set the bar high enough that it stretches students to achieve at levels they didn't even realize they could achieve themselves. The um, the uh, relevance piece is answering that age old question. Why do I need to learn this and how am I ever going to use it later on? Well, that's our job to to not only teach them what they need to learn today, but also share with them how learning it today is going to benefit them later on in life. Okay. And then I would argue that the third R is the most important one, and that is the relationship piece. And that is developing a very positive adult student relationship. Uh, that so that every student on that campus knows that there are one or more adults on that campus that are taking a keen interest in what is happening uh, in their lives and trying to set them up for the best chance of success. And that old adage about they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care is so true. Yeah, that's Once right. they know you really care about them, they'll run through a brick wall for you and do whatever you ask them to do. And then that uh, bottom part of the uh, poster deals with the four C's of 21st century learning. Again, just stole the good idea, but uh, it's all research based, just like the three R's. And so I think there is something to it. But in general, what that means is we need to be preparing students for succeeding later on in life. And we need to be providing opportunities for them to practice being good uh, communicators and uh, be creative and uh, critical thinkers and be very uh, 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 creative and uh, do things a little bit differently. It's okay to think outside the box yep. and um, to do things differently. Which one did I leave out there? Cr uh, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Collaboration, yep. Yeah, yep. collaboration. And obviously every employer wants uh, people that can work well within teams, whether it be large or small. And even when they need to disagree, they know how to disagree agreeably and uh, work as a team. So we need to be providing students with all of those opportunities to practice in those areas, get constructive criticism and feedback in those areas, uh, make adjustments, do it again, and go through that whole learning cycle over and over and over again so that when they leave our hallways at graduation time, they are better prepared to succeed in the real world, regardless of whether they're going into higher education or directly into the workforce. Would you say that um, you, you learn by doing, so you're utilizing those three R's and the four C's as to how you lead and uh, expect your, your, your folks that work for you that are actually representing the school di district to, to perform and interact with one another? I think uh, there's a certain amount of uh, the the 30,000 foot uh, umbrella yep. view that needs to start at the top and then be shared with everybody. I don't necessarily tell them how to do it, but uh, I, I want them all working on those things, the three R's and the four C's. Yep. And we'll get to another acronym in a minute that I also emphasize. But I think uh, some of that type of uh, mission and vision work has to start at the top. And obviously when I come into a new district, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that with the school board and kind of getting them to embrace the, what I'm going to be sharing with others. Yep. And then it trickles down from there. So, yeah, I think there's a certain amount of uh, leadership skill to that in working with people, but also kind of setting the tone and then uh, following up on that. I love that. Well, coming into a new district, that can be uh, somewhat challenging, obviously leading 
in today's world, you know, school districts have just a, a crazy amount of challenges right now, whether it be teacher retention or staff retention, uh, being sure that you're communicating effectively with your constituents, coming in and, and trying to navigate the politics of the school board. What do you say that to someone out there that is a new superintendent as they are looking at their first big opportunity what's what's some advice that you might give them as to how they integrate because i think you've come into these environments and you've had to to you know work those relationships and develop those relationships from you know day one and that i i would love to hear your perspective on on what you do effectively whether it's a small district or a big district as to how you've been able to be successful in all three of those categories one of the things I share with them is that uh, you're going to be faced with adversity at some point in time in your career. And sometimes it comes right off the bat. I can remember when I took over as superintendent of schools in Stephenville, Texas, I thought I was coming into a pretty good situation, a very solid situation. Yeah. Uh, Mark Brawls had been there and won four state championships, you know, and I thought, well, this is going to be great. <laughs> I'll go in there and, and I bring in with me a new, uh, uh, business manager, chief financial officer, and she and I very quickly discovered that the district was broke a year before we got there, but Ooh. didn't realize it or just chose to ignore it. And so then it's our job to share that with everybody and go about fixing it. Uh, obviously not a situation that any new superintendent wants to come yeah. into. Uh, and the school year, uh, the contracts had already been signed. So when 80% of your budget is tied up in personnel uh, and they're under contract, we had to get through that first year and, and, and develop a personnel reduction plan to implement that summer, that following summer. Yeah. And you can imagine how popular that was, you know, yeah. it started laying people off, et cetera. And uh, it was difficult. And I'm thinking, what in the hell have I gotten into? Yeah. You know, that's not what I signed up for. Exactly. Uh, but there's a whole art to that too, not the least of which is when you discover a very difficult problem, you can't as superintendent stick your head in the sand. You got to deal with it up front and then devise a plan to a communicate the issue. Obviously it starts with the board. And then in that situation where it was a financial, I had to then communicate with the Texas education agency and say, Hey, can you help us out here? And, and we had a good enough relationship with them that they kind of front loaded us on some uh, payments that kind of bridged the gap there for us. But then I had to also meet with the uh, top taxpayers in the community and say, look, uh, this is a this is an issue, and and here are the steps we're going to have to take to resolve it. And that's back when we had a little flexibility in setting sure. the tax rate, and I was trying to prepare them for the fact that we were going to have to raise taxes some to help us get out of that hole, along with personnel reduction, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if nothing else, we did a good job of communication to make sure a everybody was familiar with the problem and what it was. And we didn't create the problem. We were just there to fix it. And then they knew what was coming in order for us to get that district out of financial uh, bind. And uh, so I feel really good about uh, what we did there because it set them on a track to be uh, successful financially that they still enjoy today. That's great. Yeah. And you, you clearly had success for sure there. And uh, 14 years at, at Stephenville, right? Right. Yeah. 2000 to 2014. So uh, well, it's where both of my kids grew up and it was a great place to raise kids, a great place to uh, be superintendent. I enjoyed it. If if you were, if this video will probably find its way into the, you know, into the feeds of people that maybe don't know someone in the school district as well as we do here, or don't have the opportunity to talk necessarily to school district leaders, but what what would you like the, you know, the, the general public to know about the challenges that school districts are facing, whether it's in Texas or here in the U.S. in general? I think there are a number of challenges that school districts are facing right now. It seems like school districts are being bombarded from every direction. And, and I'm not really sure how we ended up being the bad guys. It yeah. just makes no sense to me. Every day, educators come to work and try to do their very best for kids and try to set them up for success. You know, reading, writing, arithmetic, and all of the other things that we do from extracurricular activities to uh, uh, supervision and uh, character development and on and on. 
so for politicians and others to just continue to hammer and vilify educators as if most are coming to work every day to try to damage kids, it's just not accurate. Yeah. It's not yeah. happening. And it, it infuriates me that 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 continues to happen all in the vein of getting some pet political project through you know if in order to get this done we've got to vilify the educators and the educational systems and and it just drives me insane and yeah. it's, it's a shame and then we wonder why there are not enough people in the teacher pipeline and there's yeah. such a teacher shortage nationwide that is a big reason right there yeah yeah uh, well said you mentioned an acronym another acronym that you wanted to share I do uh, want to share the acronym, uh, again, research-based, but it is P as in Paul, O-S-C-E. And, and, and this acronym stands for, each of those letters stands for a skill, ability, or attribute that highly successful leaders possess. Doesn't matter okay. if they're superintendents, uh, campus administrators, teachers, or in any other leadership role. They need to be good planners. They need to plan for the here and now and the intermediate and the long range. They need to be really good organizers. They need to organize themselves, but also be able to organize students or campuses or entire districts and do that very well. And there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, the S is they, they need to be really good stimulators. You could insert the word motivator there. They need to be able to motivate or stimulate the people that are in front of them, whether they be young people or teams or groups of people. Uh, could be parents or uh, taxpayers uh, trying to get a bond issue passed, things like that. Uh, the C is they, so we got planning, organizing, stimulating, coordinating is the C. They, uh, administrators, for instance, have to juggle a lot of balls in the air at the same time. And if they are not very structured and organized and uh, good time managers, well, then something is going to fall through the cracks. So the, uh, the coordinator part is, is crucial into in, in making sure that they organize themselves and can coordinate everything they need to at home with juggling kids and all of that. But make sure that all of those things fall into place of good time managers and uh, organization, et cetera, so they can coordinate everything effectively. And the last one is we got planning, organizing, stimulating, coordinating, and evaluating is the E not only uh, for administrators purposes, not only evaluating teachers in the classroom, but also evaluating everything on that campus or in that district. And you could extrapolate that to any leadership role in sure. any uh, business. Um, they've got to uh, evaluate effectively and then make adjustments appropriately so that um, their responsibility is to make sure they're observing, but changing when necessary and appropriate. So I try to share that acronym of planning, organizing, stimulating, coordinating, and evaluating with all of my uh, uh, administrators, but also my teachers. And when we had opening convocation this year, I went over that same thing with them uh, because it's pertinent to what teachers do every day, but also school administrators. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Well, you, you mentioned motivation. How do you stay motivated as a leader of your school district? Well, some of that I think is internal. Uh, you either you either got it or you ain't. And uh, I think uh, it's always been there for me. I always knew what I wanted to do. I started out teaching and coaching and uh, very quickly got into administration. And I knew that after I got into administration that I wanted to aspire to the superintendency. So I went about chipping away at what I felt like needed to happen in my career to get there. Um, so, so the internal motivation piece uh, for me has never been uh, too difficult. Um, as far as motivating others, it's um, depending on the situation and the person, it, it does become difficult sometimes. Uh, you know, you could use the analogy of uh, uh, coaching an athletic team. Uh, and Jimmy Johnson used to talk about, uh, you know, he doesn't treat Troy Aikman the same way he treats the third string safety, you know, yeah. uh, third string safety is sitting back there in the back of the meeting room uh, watching film and falls asleep he's cutting him he's gone the next day or that yeah. day 
And uh, is he going to do that to Troy Aikman? Nope. Uh, so uh, you, you got to use a different management style with uh, students and uh, teachers and support staff and child nutrition workers and maintenance workers and bus drivers and on and on. So I think you have to be kind of situational on the, the motivation piece and figure out what uh, triggers or motivates that particular person and then try to um, keep that in mind when you're uh, conversing with them or, or dealing with them in some leadership capacity. Well, and that comes back to the relationship piece that you touched on, right? Yeah, Being yeah. one of the things that, you know, sort of one of the mandates that um, is how everybody, you, know, you get the best out of everybody if you're willing to invest in in and uh, build a relationship with them. And that requires connection, which requires good communication, which requires clear understanding and appreciation for the job at hand. And uh, a good leader does that. You clearly do that. So um, we're, I think we're, there's something to that. And uh, there's also something to this uh, idea about management by wandering around. Yeah, and it's a whole thing. It's a real thing. And I've just had the conversation with my new middle school principal uh, last week about that. As a campus administrator, you have to force yourself to get up and out and about in amongst them in amongst the kids and in amongst the teachers because it serves a number of purposes. A, they need to see you out there, but yeah. B, uh, a teacher that is way down the hall can ask you a question that they're not going to have time to get all the way down to the office uh, yep. anytime during that day to, to do that. And you can either give them the answer right then and you solve the problem uh, or say, don't know, but I'll get back with you yep. and make sure you do that. I love that. I love that. Well, the last couple of questions that I have for you, uh, in your opinion, what makes a great leader? I think what makes a great leader is someone that is willing to put in the work and willing to show up and be there for the right reason. You know, we got a lot of activities in the school business and uh, sometimes leaders get tired and uh, they don't want to go to the seventh grade volleyball game uh, and you know, that type of thing. But showing up, I think, is a big part of it to show support, uh, being there for those that you are leading and then serving in a somewhat of a mentorship capacity for them. But back to the three R's and the relationship piece, yeah. it is developing good communication skills so that you can develop a very positive supervisor um relationship with that person so that when they do need to come in and shut the door and say, you know, when you're good, you're really good. But when you're not, you're not. <laughs> uh, they have a good enough relationship with you that they feel like they can do that. And uh, so I think that's very important. And uh, obviously, one of the reasons we have that as one of the three R's. Well, kind of as I shared with you, you know, one of my passions is the ripple effect. I talk about that concept because it's such an impactful way to look at leadership. But talk about a ripple she did for you closing that door and telling you, uh, telling you like it was, huh? Still stays with me today. And that was 1992, I think it was. And here we are in 2024, still stays with me now. And uh, I share that story with people all the time. It's a powerful one. And I, I appreciate you sharing it here. Last question. If you had the opportunity to put any phrase on a billboard for your students, your staff, or your community, what would you like that phrase to be? There is no substitution for proper communication and relationship building. I think it comes down to that because a lot of the problems that we deal with in education today come down to lack of communication or poor communication, lack of attention to details, like I was talking to the AD about, yep. and not focusing enough time, effort, and energy on building that very positive relationship. And I think when we do those two things, good communicators, good developer of uh, positive relationships, then it solves a whole bunch of problems in uh, the educational world today. Oh, that's excellent. What a perfect way to end. Yeah. You know, Blue Ridge ISD is very lucky to have you, Dr. Floyd. We're lucky that you agreed to do this. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of this. Um, I, I feel like I can learn so much from you and, and I hope we can continue the conversation and build a friendship here. But most importantly, we want to get, you know, the 
the emphasis out on what you're doing and how you're doing it so that we can promote the great work. And uh, I hopefully we'll have other school leaders that may reach out to you and, and want to pick your brain about what they could be doing differently at their districts. That's great. I appreciate the invitation and I've enjoyed the visit. Thank you. Thank you so much.